Welcome. As we continue our journey through the Word of God, and today we are going to be starting our journey through 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at the first six verses today. And there's quite a lot in this. I looked at ways I could break it up, but I couldn't really break it up, so we're going to just do it as uh, economically as we can uh, while we dive into this. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're getting to the last two chapters of the second letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And it is really where the tone of his letter starts to change, where he's talking about the strength of grace in weakness and how weakness shows the strength of grace. And that's the, the message he's really trying to get across here. And to do that, he has to actually talk about something that he's very reluctant to talk about. In fact, he tells us in these coming verses that he's about to share something with the church in Corinth that happened 14 years ago, and he's never told anybody about it. And he doesn't really want to tell anybody about it because he doesn't want it to seem like boasting, but he needs to tell them so that they understand the point of what he's trying to say in his letter. So that's the context. Paul's struggling with, when he's writing this particular chapter, he's like, oh, I can't believe I've got to tell them this. I really don't want to. And it wasn't anything bad. It was just something that he didn't want them to think was boasting about him. So this is, that's the context for what he's about to write. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, that's like something, yeah, oh, I know somebody, yeah. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, but God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Paul had to talk about revelations of the Lord because the these super apostles that were in Corinth that were fake apostles uh, had been claiming that they had been the recipients of uh, a lot of supernatural, spectacular spiritual experiences, uh, things like visions and revelations from the Lord. They are God told me kind of thing. Well, God told me and God showed me this and God showed me that. And Paul was reluctantly boasting since the last chapter, but now he's going to boast of his own visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, his reluctance is in these first few verses. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. Paul's actually, by the point of this time in the letter, almost sick and tired of writing about himself. Uh, he'd actually rather write about Jesus and talk about Jesus, but the, the worldly thinking of the church in Corinth uh, and how, how little they thought of Paul made them think also very little about Jesus. Uh, and he had to correct that. So he had to correct how they thought about him so they'd think differently about Jesus based on his experience with Jesus. So he talks about visions and revelations. Now, angels, uh, visions about heaven, those things were very common in the New Testament. In fact, there's a lot of in instances in the New Testament about people have visions of heaven and uh, angels. So let me just read through a few of them, just so you understand where they are. Uh, Zechariah, who was the father of John the Baptist, had a vision of an angel in Luke chapter 1. Jesus' transfiguration was an amazing event, uh, the, uh, described as a vision uh, in front of his disciples in Matthew 17. The women who came to visit Jesus at the tomb had a vision of angels in Luke chapter 24. Uh, Stephen saw a vision of Jesus at his own death when he was being stoned in Acts chapter 7. Ananias experienced a vision telling him to go to to Saul in Acts 9, go and pray for him and, and he'll receive the Holy Spirit. He had a vision. That's what caused him to go to Saul in the first place. Uh, Peter had a vision of the, the clean and unclean animals in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. Peter had a vision of an angel when he, when he was released from prison in Acts chapter 12. John had a lot of visions 
uh, the, the book of Revelation is, is one vision after another of John uh, on the island of Patmos. Now, Paul had a revelation of Jesus. He had lots of revelations. Revelation of Jesus on the road to Damascus when, when a supernatural experience in Acts chapter 22 uh, and Acts chapter 26. He, uh, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia uh, asking him to come to that region for help in Acts chapter 16. Uh, Paul had an encouraging vision while he was in Corinth uh, in Acts chapter 18, and Paul also had a vision of an angel on the ship that was about to be wrecked in Acts chapter 27. So it's not surprising that Paul now talks in 2 Corinthians of how God spoke to him through visions and revelations. Now, we have to understand, though, as Christ followers, that when people say that they had a vision or revelation, they are subject to, one, us misunderstanding what somebody's telling us, and two, misapplication of whatever the meaning of the vision or the dream was. And we also have to understand that whatever benefits they, that do come from somebody getting a revelation or a dream, they are usually limited to being for the person who receives them, which is why I caution people all the time when somebody comes up and says, I had a dream about you or I had a dream, uh, a vision for you. Now, does, can that happen? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Is it rare when it's actually real? Yes, it is. I think so. Uh, I, from my understanding of Scripture and from scriptural examples, uh, most people's visions or dreams are God giving them a vision or dream for themselves. Now, Paul says, I know a man in Christ. And you can struggle, you can sense his struggle here right now because He's describing this experience in the third person instead of the first person. In other words, he didn't say, listen, I had this experience. And so some people wonder, well, was he really speaking about himself or is he speaking about somebody else? But in verse 7, the, the very ver first verse after the ones we've just looked at, he transitions into the first person. So he is actually writing about himself, but he starts off doing that. Now, why did he do that? Guzik has a really good uh, explanation of this. Uh, I'm going to read to you. Why does he use the third person at all in the first six verses of this chapter? Because Paul, in describing this remarkable spiritual experience, is describing just the kind of thing that the super apostles among the Corinthian Christians would glory in. When he described his humble experiences in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 30, he did not hesitate to write in the first person. No one would think he was glorifying himself as the super apostles did. But here, he walks more carefully. Paul does everything he can to relate this experience without bringing glory to himself. And then he says, this happened 14 years ago. Paul kept quiet about this for 14 years, and now he's mentioning it reluctantly. And he says, whether in the body I do not know, whether out of the body I don't know, but God knows. Paul doesn't know himself if he was, if it was, actually something physically that happened to him, or if it was something that happened to him spiritually where he had a dream or a vision, uh, either one is possible. And you know, a lot of people have asked, well, what actually happened to Paul? Was he carried up in, the body of, in his body to heaven or did his spirit separate from itself and, and, and his spirit went to heaven and his body stayed here? Or, but we, we don't know, we're never gonna know. But the whole point of this passage is that Paul didn't know and if he didn't know, you and I can't know. So you've got to leave it at that. And that's a lot of scripture. And there's a lot of scripture that Paul wrote where you just have to leave it at that. He doesn't tell you the answer. You don't know what it is. So you've got to leave it at that. Paul emphasizes the point twice by saying in verse 2 and verse 3, I don't know. So you and I speculating about it, total not a waste of time. And he says, such one was caught up to the third heaven. Now that's a phrase that could be misinterpreted and misapplied by a lot of people. But we have to look at the context of the day in which Paul wrote this letter. He was using terminology that was very common in that time about the place where God dwelt. So the blue sky, people would call the blue sky, the sky that you could see, they, could call, they would call that the first heaven. That's in the first heaven. The starry sky up at, at night, when you looked up into the heavens, that was called the second heaven. And then the place wherever God ruled and reigned, that was called the third heaven. That was common terminology of the time. So that's what Paul was writing. The person was taken to the place where God dwelt. 
And he says, so this one, whom now we understand to be Paul himself, was caught up to heaven where God lives in a vision. Paul had a vision or an experience of the throne of God. Now, that was exactly the same as what happened to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. And it also happened to John in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. Paul says he was caught up to paradise, which is an interesting use of that word. And he identifies this third heaven as paradise. Now, why? This word paradise, this Greek word, was not a Greek word, it was a Persian word. And it is a Persian word for an enclosed, now what's Persia, by the way? Persia is modern day Iran, okay? And he's, this was a word used for an enclosed, luxurious garden that was only found amongst royalty that was expertly manicured by people so that it was always perfect. And that's the word that he describes. Now, Solomon actually wrote about the same word in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, and he talks about this same word, this, this Persian word, where there were pleasure grounds that somebody else maintained. So Paul says, third heaven is like that. Where God dwells is like that. And this word paradise uh, is, is something that, would not have been a new word for the people reading this letter. They would have understood it from the writings of Solomon. He says, now what happened? And of course, he's talking about himself. What happened when this person, which was really me, was taken up into heaven? What happened? He heard inexpressible words that were not lawful for a man to utter. So Paul doesn't relate anything he saw, only a very vague description of what he actually heard. Now, this is very different from a lot of people of the time of Paul and today when they get a vision, they want to tell everybody. They're not reluctant to tell people, or they want to tell everybody. And they want to tell everybody they saw in detail and write books about it, whatever. Paul's like, no, no, I'm not even going to tell you. It's not even lawful for me to do that. Uh, Paul did nothing that was self-glorifying or made himself look amazing, nor did he do anything to make himself look foolish. He was very cautious. 14 years, and when he said it, he was reluctant to say it. And he did everything when he was telling this story to make sure the focus was taken off himself. Started off by writing in the third person. And he doesn't describe the amazing visions of paradise other than calling it an expertly manicured garden, like that royalty, only people in royalty had. Uh, then he says, listen, the things I heard, they're not lawful for, for a man to utter. So many people have asked for a long time, so what did he hear? Well, it's a complete and utter waste of time to think about it because Paul said they were inexpressible words, which it's not lawful for a man to utter. God did not want you and I to know, so they would have been in the Bible had he wanted us to know. So he didn't give Paul permission to speak and say what they were. So he says, of such one I will boast. Yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. Paul says, listen, this nameless man who had the vision uh, really did have something to boast, boast about, which was actually Paul himself. But he says, but I, I can only ever, me personally, I can only boast of my affirmities. Another reason why he started off by using the third person, because he wanted to separate the, the, the Paul in this vision from the Paul who had the physical weaknesses that the church in Corinth saw. And that's exactly what he had boasted in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And he says, listen, I, did, I might desire to boast, but I'd be a fool, and I'm not going to be a fool. Paul, Paul's very uh, directly saying here, I'm contrasting myself with those super apostles that you've got in Corinth. Uh, they wouldn't hesitate to boast about this vision if they had it. Uh, they'd write books and you know, do all those kind of things. And he said, and if they did, they'd be a fool, and I'm not going to be a fool, so I won't do that. Um, and, and this is the conundrum we find ourselves in, is a lot of times we, uh, we think the only people that have profound experiences of, you know, oh, I went to heaven, are those people who boast about them, and they boast about them so confidently. But Paul never did that. That's why I'm so sceptical when people do it and make TV programs out of it. Oh, I'm so special. God called me up to heaven and I went up to heaven. This is what I saw in heaven. This is what God told me. And then he sent me back here to tell, tell, tell you useless people because you're obviously never going to get there. Uh, the proof of Paul's incredibly profound experiences were found in his 
change of life from who he was, Saul of Tarsus, who murdered Christians, to Paul the Apostle, who started the church, and this incredible ministry that he had. That's what he was saying. That's the fruit right there. Paul thought it was very important to mention this experience, but he didn't want to dwell on it. He didn't want to try and sell himself to the church in Corinth. Uh, he, he says, listen, I'm, uh, I, but I forbear. He's holding back from his own description because he didn't want to persuade the Christian Corinthians uh, that he was just another super apostle like these other ones. Lest anyone should think uh, of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. Uh, if the Christian Corinthians uh, thought that Paul was weak and different from the other false apostles, that was fine with him. He actually didn't mind. He wanted them to know that he wanted them to see the glory of God expressed in his weakness, not in his amazing story. And that leads us to our observation. Why was Paul given this vision? Well, he was given it for you and for me, firstly, so that we'd be reading it in the word of God forever. So we benefit from whatever the Lord had showed Paul. I think secondly, he was given it because what God gave him in that vision 14 years ago, I think is one of the huge things that sustained him through all the shipwrecks, all the beatings, all the things that he went through that were horrible. I think he was remembering this vision through every one of those trials. And that enabled him to continue giving everything to God because God had given him a vision. It helped him finish his course. And that's what God will do for you and for me. Sometimes he'll speak to us and he'll give us a vision for something and then there's nothing for a long time because he's got nothing else to say. But it will sustain us through the tough times and the trials. See, Paul never chose to say, well, I guess that vision wasn't true. No, he realized it was from God and it sustained him. He was energized by it through the trials and tribulations of life. And he reluctantly told the story to the church in Corinth so that you and I would benefit out of it and so they would understand the strength that comes from weakness. So there you go. What do you observe out of this? A lot in that. I know there was a lot in that today. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell me what you, what you think in the comments below. Like, subscribe, share this video as much as you possibly can. Let me pray for you today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this revelation that Paul had that sustained him through ministry. I pray, Lord, that people who are watching this today would get their own revelation, not live off the revelation of other people, but get their own, Lord, and they would, they would have that sustain them through the tough times of life. I, I pray, Lord, for wisdom and discernment about people that we, we should listen to and, and, and people that we should uh, allow to sow seeds into our lives. Just be very careful and wise about that, Lord. And I, I pray, Lord, that we would always continue to rightly divide the word of truth in every single way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.